Yep, we are all good. Brilliant. And I'll let you know within two days. If I don't let you know, then you can toss the recording. But I just my audit, my editor will check through within a day. Cool. Sounds are you good. well? How is your soul? Yeah, it's it's mixed. I would say it's a it's a little bit mixed. Um, I mean, things are pretty cool here in Bali, so I can't mm. complain. Cool. Well, can you? we jump into it? We can just chat and and just uh, catch up while we we jump in. Yeah, sounds good. Hello, Thrivers. I've got Cribben Governor on the Made to Thrive show. He's the second time on this podcast, and he's had so many downloads on our first episode, which is 7th of September, 2020. I know the date because I sent so many patients, so many clients to that link. They love the show. And so I believe here we've got a food scientist that is the premier food scientist, nutritionist in the world. And the greatest thing is this man has character, and he has a heart to see people's lives changed. So, Crib and Govinda, welcome back to the show. Steve, it's my absolute pleasure. I had a great time in the first episode, so hopefully I can do the second episode as much justice as I can. Brilliant. Tell us about your life. You've moved to Bali. Why the move? What's been happening? Yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, it's been now more than one year since we, we left. We left Melbourne for... Indonesia and settle down here in Bali. I think that the main the main problem that we had going through the struggles in Melbourne was the lockdown. So I think this the six months of the hard lockdown really affected us from a mental perspective. And I I saw my own mental health deteriorating quite substantially. And also the main thing was was the children, you know, really being stuck at home with the the schooling at home as well, the online learning, they weren't getting anything done. They were just literally yeah. watching YouTube videos and and uh, playing games so that there was not much learning happening. So we made a very hard decision to actually leave Australia and which we absolutely love Australia. You know, it's my home for 30 years and move to a foreign nation in Indonesia in Bali and Bali we've been to many times in the past we loved Bali we thought Bali was infrastructure wise set up to suit the Australian expectations in terms of you know standards and all that kind of stuff and do not regret at all moving my family to Bali my kids straight away got settled into school so they were they were in school um, you know, with all the with all the precautions uh, necessary, and they were in school and back to face to face learning. So they've been loving the journey and, and loving the new lifestyle. And I'd say we're very settled now in Indonesia, and we're we're loving it. And hopefully, when things settle down again, we'll be able to head back home to Melbourne. Oh, so that's the plan to go back to Australia and sort of an interim move to Bali and. The business Nourish Me Organics, obviously the website, we'll put a link, uh, incredible website with an incredible shop as well. But uh, so did the business carry on and then you're going to head back to Australia when things sort of settle down? Yes, yeah, Steve, we have a, we're really fortunate actually. We have an amazing team in Melbourne running our our, our distribution and our, and our factory in Melbourne. So it was business as usual. So, I mean, we're, we're managing everything remotely and I think most people can appreciate now with remote working most people are working from home over the last couple of years so it's no different in me you know being at home in Melbourne managing my team versus being here in Bali managing my team so it's been really seamless with technology is amazing now with Zoom and all the, the other tools that we have so it's been almost a hiccup free i mean you're always going to have a few hiccups here and there but i could say we're really fortunate and blessed to have an amazing team in melbourne and opportunistically now being able to set up a team here for our indonesian and asian expansion here using bali as the hub so and one thing i didn't mention is we one of the main reasons to leave was also to set up a hub for for asia so we decided to pick indonesia to be our hub for the Asian market, and so we've set up our a little little presence uh, sales office here in in Indonesia, which really off to a good start as well. So that's been, been keeping me very busy here to to get things up and running. So we 
we built a facility here in uh, in Bali. We were lucky to find a location. We built a small little shop and uh, manufacturing presence here in Bali. And obviously, we export a lot of our products from Australia into Bali for the Asian market. And it's off to an amazing start. I'm really amazed at how good it's going, given that we are still in a pandemic. Yeah, well, well done to you. You know, I think uh, taking the, the the risk and and it is a risk. You move your whole family, you've got children, you don't know how it's going to work out. Are they going to adapt? Are they not going to adapt? But uh, I think the most important is you have an incredible product. You've got, uh, you know, your expertise on kefir, on fermented foods, and just what we've seen on your podcast has been, you know, nothing short of supernatural. So well done to you. T- tell us a little bit about kefir, uh, what you're doing, what you've learned in the last couple of years. Last time we spoke was 2020, and it's, it's almost two years ago but tell us what you've learned the new products you've got and you know i just think it's so important that you started with a dream to change people's lives yes the business has grown yes it's probably been more profitable but the heart of crib and governor is to see people's lives change through their nutrition and through fermented foods so tell us anything new about the science or what's happening with your kefir and your products Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with kefir, since we last spoke, I think we we touched on all the the benefits of the existing science at that point. But now Mm. there's an amazing study that came out quite recently, would only be a few months ago, about kefir specifically with its effects as as, as it relates to to COVID. So there's some amazing benefits and, and protective benefits from using kefir when it comes to mitigating some of the risks of, of viral infections and, and particularly we can I can send you a link later to that particular study mm. where they talked about using kefir as a, a potential a prophylactic type product for viral infections and very specifically to COVID-19 so amazing and you know I haven't stopped taking kefir I have kefir <laughs> every day for the last how many years <laughs> so You know, and specifically speaking, I think it's to do with the ACE2 receptor. The study talks about, uh, I always knew from early days about the the ACE2 receptor when it came to kefir, but now it's very clear that kefir may have some benefits to blocking the viral adhesion to the cells by having the impact on the the ACE2 receptor. So the the way it works with, with viral material of viral particles attacking a cell is that it has to bind to the ACE2 receptor. So there's a couple of things that can mitigate that. So kefir being one of that, there's a whole host of antiviral uh, natural medicines that we can use as well. But kefir and vitamin D to me are the biggest ones that are going to block that ACE2 receptor and the viral particles from attaching to cells. So that has been an amazing revelation over the last few months. I, I've also put it on my Instagram at Gut Health Guru. So if you want to look at that particular study and some of the infographics on how the mechanisms of kefir work, head to my Instagram and check it out. And you can see the link to the study there as well. Fantastic. So kefir improving your immune function as a preventative. And also, is it a form of treatment if someone gets a viral infection? You know, I, I think things are turning. South Africa is very positive. I saw a lot of people today at the coffee shop without a mask. Wherever I've gone, I've always not try and wear a mask. So people ask me, I direct them to the science, to the research about masks. And in a very sort of loving way, I think, you know, these fundamentalists on both sides, the message and the method is very important and the moment how you share that message is crucially important but i saw people a lot more relaxed obviously you know boris and his uh you know his uh declaration yesterday it's gone viral on on, on whatsapp and that and no more mandates no more uh you know vaccine passes so it's it's, it's changed already and I, I see people that are far more relaxed the omicron has you know many people have been sick but the hospitals have been empty which has been you know really encouraging to see but tell, tell me, if someone gets a viral infection, can they use kefir if they've never used it before to, to treat the, the, the infection? I haven't seen any data to support the, the treatment. I think it's more the prophylactic for preventing these type of viral infections and also obviously bacterial infections as well because kefir is so rich in different types of probiotic bacteria, lactobacillus, bifida bacteria, a whole host of other beneficial organisms as well. But I, I think, you know, there's from a treatment perspective, there's things like 
you know, like a cincho. I'm all about the natural health, so I'll really focus on the natural health. There's obviously some great pharmaceutical products that people can mm. use for for treatment, but I I look at natural health products, things like a cinchona extract, you know, which is very high in uh, quinine, which is a very similar compound that's been used for malaria compared to another pharmaceutical product. Mm. So quinine is a great one because it's a zinc ionophore. So basically what it does is it helps the zinc to actually get into the cell where zinc can block that viral replication pathway. So, you know, quinine extract is amazing. You know, obviously combined with zinc is a great one. Another one, great one is quercetin. You know, not many people know one of the richest food sources of quercetin is actually capers. So, you know, including some capers in your diet just to boost up your quercetin. There's some great quercetin supplements as well that people can look at. Obviously, getting out in the sun and getting lots of uh, vitamin D3 is another good uh, good way to sort of uh, get better when you get sick as well. But uh, for, fortunately, what we're seeing now with Omicron is in most cases, it's pretty mild compared to the initial initial strains that we were variants that we saw So, I mean, it's just like any other cold and flu and how we deal with it, aside from someone that's immunocompromised, then obviously a lot more is required to get these people happy. But from my perspective, you know, it's all about prevention. So it's all about, you know, keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself fit, making sure you're not in that category where you're developing diabetes or metabolic diseases where your risk profile then substantially increases but if you put in the work now making sure we're eating clean healthy natural foods real food no processed junk getting lots of good exercise getting out in the sun getting you know your vitamin d getting your circadian rhythm rhythms right adopting things like uh, uh, fasting uh, methodologies intermittent fasting all these things are going to set you up so then you're not going to be in that high risk category. So if you do pick up a, a dreaded a dreaded COVID or any other viral or bacterial infection, your body can deal with it pretty easily because it's not stressed out fighting other disease states at the same time. So I think that's mm. really the key. Another great one that I've come across recently is black seed oil. So that's another good natural remedy as well. So that's you know, very rich in different types of compounds or polyphenols. And it's got some great literature and studies behind it as well when it comes to, you know, dealing with uh, bronchial type infections, you know, uh, viral infections, boosting immunity, all that stuff is great. Something that people might not be aware of, groundbreaking stuff I'm talking about now. Mm. Wow. Coll- wow. Collagen from kangaroos. Wow, jeez, never yeah. heard of this one, Kevin. Oh yes, it's it's a re- it's a revolutionary product, really, because no one's really talking about it yet. But I've seen the the early literature coming out with this with this stuff, and it's amazing when it comes to its anti blood clotting abilities. Hmm. Wow. So you know, people struggling with you know a, a small percentage of people have adverse reactions to different medications so they can potentially use something like collagen i think it's there's different types of collagen peptides that can exert benefits when it comes to its anti blood clotting abilities but the particular mm-hmm. one i've seen is is the uh, collagen the, the collagen from kangaroos another great one well, you might you might yeah. be aware of this one because you're a chinese uh, Chinese medicine practitioner. Yeah. Have you ever come across e No, no, no. Not with regards to viral. Yeah. yeah. Not, not so much relating to viral in this conversation now. I mean, e is like a donkey collagen. Donkey collagen. Okay. But it also has <laughs> some, it exerts some sort of benefits when it comes to blood health. Oh, Specif- wow. Specifically wow. when it comes to menstrual issues with women and also, you know, anemia, things like that. It's, you know, it's in the, um, the Chinese pharmacopoeia. It's been used for thousands of years. People go so crazy about donkey collagen that they've basically come close to eradicating their donkey population in China. Sure. It's a, it's wow. a big problem. But fortunately now in Australia, we have a lot of feral donkeys. So, ba- so what's happened is that 
when they cull the donkeys, now there's an upstream value add by taking yeah. or using the uh, waste stream materials, the skin and all this uh, material that's typically thrown out and turning mm-hmm. it into Ija, which is a uh, huge uh, from, you know, like a natural health, Chinese health benefit that's hugely popular in China, anti-aging, uh, skin, all that kind of stuff but also very specifically used when it comes to blood. There seems to be some something going on when it comes to collagen consumption and blood. So, you know, I'm, I'm still researching. I'm still in that research phase to understand it more. Well, when you get the data and the links and the articles and send them our way so we can put it on the podcast and on the YouTube video, I think that's important. If you're looking at kangaroo cartilage, you're going to be obviously... I assume stocking it on the Nourish Me uh, Organics website. So are you going to be sort of distributing also the donkey cartilage as well as the kangaroo cartilage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we've got both on our website. I mean, the, the kangaroo is on the website right now. I mean, ooh, you, you're going to love this. It's very effective when it comes to erectile dysfunction. Sure. Very, again, wow. it's something to do with blood flow. It's something to do with, with, the, with this kangaroo uh, collagen. And I've tried it myself, so I, it works. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Brilliant. And what's the difference between that and sort of the, you know, any bovine uh, collagen or any uh, marine collagen? What's the difference? Great question, Steve. I mean, they all differ in the, the peptides. So, you know, there's glycine, there's proline, there's, there's di- a different balance between the peptide content so something like bovine collagen has, you know, things like type one, type three, and then you got marine collagen that has a different mix. It's got different types. There's all these different types of uh, collagen strain, strands. So the peptides are just, if you think a protein is the, the long chain of the molecule. And then if you chop, chop up that protein, you get these smaller strands of peptides. And if you go even further down, then you go down to the individual amino acids. So each of these peptides ex- exerts a slightly different benefit. So when, you, when you're talking the, the marine collagen, for, for instance, it's very effective when it comes to skin. The peptide mixture is very good when it comes to beauty and skin. Bovine collagen seems to help a lot with gut health issues, you know, gut permeability, leaky gut, things like that. The kangaroo collagen is very specific when it comes to blood and, you know, um, vascular dilation, stopping blood clotting, things like that. And then the donkey collagen seems to be helping when it comes to menstrual issues with women. That's what it's specifically used in Chinese medicine. But then there's a whole host of other benefits as well. So you know, all these products will be available on our website if people are interested. I mean, it's so early. I mean, I think we would be the, one of the first companies in the whole world to, to launch uh, kangaroo collagen. There's nothing available out there. I think we, we're probably the first ones. EJR has been used for thousands of years, so, but I don't think it's readily accepted yet or known about. So that's a better word. Yeah. Known about yeah. in the West, but it's certainly known yeah in Chinese uh, Chinese uh, medicine. Great. Uh, I want you to just consider that I'm a client of yours and, and a patient. I, I'll give you my backstory on fermented foods and kefir. Is I've got an incredible colleague who got a farm, organic farm. He's a medical doctor, runs an incredible clinic as a functional medicine practitioner. We've become good friends. He does my platelet-rich plasma injections, my prolotherapy, my prolozone. And uh, he gave me many, many years ago, I mean, we've been friends for 12 years. He gave me a bottle of the grains of kefir and he told me how to do it. And I probably did it for a couple of years, but just the, the PT of doing it and watching it and trying to convince my wife of the smell. And, you know, I, so I now go to a natural health store and this is my story. This is my honest story. And I buy the kefir and I, I try and change it up to get microbial diversity. And I've done the organic acids test and a stool test. That says I've got a huge microbial diversity, which is great because I don't stick to similar probiotic fermented foods. I always try and change things and 
and use sunlight and grounding and hug trees because and dogs and animals to try and improve the microbiome which we spoke about and we can get into a bit of the details because i'd like to know the research and science but try and sort of persuade me why i should be growing my own grains because when i go into your website and i look at all the kits that you've got and what you're doing it seems obviously the better way to do it although there are a lot of natural companies that are got the goat kefir with the raw milk and you know the the normal kefir as well full cream kefir is why should people like myself rather be growing their own and kefir and doing it themselves it's a very easy answer this is a really simple one it the main thing is that the ones that you get from the store are likely going to be the fake stuff very simply because the alcohol content that's produced during a fermentation is normally restrictive and it comes from a you know legislative perspective when it gets to a certain percentage like 0.5 you've got to start getting liquor licenses so not many people can actually overcome that hurdle based on the legislation in their area and the, the other thing is it's it's so much easier and cheaper to just get a stock standard kefir and in inverted commas uh, starter culture which is typically going to be just a yogurt starter culture majority of the time sometimes there might be a couple of kefir isolates in there and so really then when you're buying that product from a store all you're buying is the hype you're buying oh kefir is good for this and good for that and it's good for covid and good. but the problem is it's not the real stuff because kefir that you make at home yourself, the real stuff that's been made for thousands of years, you know, originally from the Caucasus Mountains and these ancient people making this product, the benefits of that product come from the bacteria itself, but also going back to the peptides, it's all the individual peptides that exert this medicinal benefit onto the, the person consuming it. And when you're not making the product from start to finish, you might be getting a handful of yogurt type bacteria from a commercial product, maybe one or two kefir strains, but you're missing out on all the peptides, the postbiotics, you know, that's also the peptides, the vitamins, the plethora of different bacteria and real kefir. You're talking, you know, a couple of trillion organisms per serve, a hundred different types, up to 100 different types of probiotic organisms. So I think you're really going to be shortchanging yourself. But I understand okay. I understand that it's easy to just go to the store and pick up some kefir. And you know, look, if that's if that's uh, that works for you, there's still benefit in it. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. most of these products are natural. They don't contain additives. They're a good little gateway into the world of fermentation. But ultimately, if you want the full gamut of benefits from kefir, it all starts with making it yourself at home, or if you've got a friend that makes it, or if you're fortunate enough to find a company that actually does it the proper way and makes it mm. from start to finish using kefir grains, that's probably going to be the best, the best thing for you. But, you know, each, each to the way. So you, you pick your own adventure. So now I'm going to push you a little and press you a little. It's like if there's an organic farm and they now send it to or like a little organic wholesale distribution retail store and then it says no additives and it's just, but it's just liquid. It doesn't have any grains inside. There has, do you, how do, would you test that to see, you know, how beneficial that is, whether you should do your own or not? Or, you know, it almost seems like unless you're very sick and you've got your backstory of mental ill health and issues and you're desperate that you're going to go this sort of uh you know personal route i mean how do people know the difference what to do because i look at your website and i think let's you know i want to talk to you Grimm, let's do an affiliation on my website let's i see you deliver to south africa let's give south africans the opportunity with a kit and and the real grains and, and a little video on how to do it and empower people to do it but is there a huge difference with quality how are south africans or africans going to test these products that have been so dubbed as organic from an organic farm with high concentrations of probiotics the easiest way to to look at it is the label is a, a good telltale sign so if you if you read the label and it you just look at the organisms that they're listing so 
you know, the most the most prolific kefir organism is going to be a Lactobacillus kefiranophaceans and Lactobacillus kefiri. So those two. So if you see those two on the label, then, you know, that's a good starting sign that at least it has the two major kefir organisms. So this is going to be a, a reasonable product, I think. Okay, it's, it's organic. It's got no additives. It's got a couple of kefir strings. Tick, tick, all good. But if you read the label and it's got, you know, uh, lactobacillus, um, you know, uh, like a uh, just a, a generic one, or it's a like a um, Staphylococcus uh, thermophilus, a, bi a bifidobacterial strain, you know, then you're just talking uh, a yogurt culture. So this is the telltale side. If you just see the kefiri, it's easy to remember. It's just got kefiri, kefir renovations. You just look for the kefir in the word of the strain. Then you know at least there's a couple in there and there's going to be some benefits. Even better, if it's on the label, you know, made with real kefir grains, then this is even better. This means it's going to have the full gamut of different kefir mm -hmm. organisms. And then it's just a matter of getting, getting in touch with the manufacturer. You can contact them on their social media or send them an email, give them a phone call and just ask them, hey, guys, is this, is this stuff made with real kefir grains or is this a commercially available starter culture? You know, mm -hmm. some companies are really cheeky. They literally have no kefir in there. It's just literally yogurt culture, and they call it kefir. And the reason why, because there's no legislation to protect the consumer yet, because it's such an mm -hmm. early, early product coming into that sort of mainstream commercial space that it's not regulated as such. It will eventually, there will be some provenance of you know, how you call things and what you're allowed to call and what you're not allowed to call. That'll come in time. But at the moment, the easiest thing is just to look for something that's made with real kefir grains. And if you're willing to go down to the next step, you know, it's so easy and it's so cost effective to make kefir yourself. Because once you get kefir grains, you have that for life. That one culture can be used over and over and over and over. And really, your only cost is your cost of milk. And that's it. So when you, when you come to the you know, purely economic considerations yeah. and your decision making, you know, you could head down to the mm. store and buy it, or you can make it yourself mm. a fraction of the cost with so much more benefits. And many people in our community, it becomes like a pet. I mean, they love their kiffy <laughs> grains. They take care of it like a dog or a cat and they talk to it and they, <laughs> you know, they uh, put their, their intention, <laughs> their love and their gratitude into the grains and it becomes part of their family almost. Uh, In my household, that's what kiffy it means to me. Uh, you know, it's it's my uh, routine, my ritual that I've followed for, for so many years right now and I love it personally. You got a personal story, though. You got a personal experience of having yeah. mental ill health, of having depression, anxiety, of having something that you started that moved the needle, that changed significantly. And then you could find out all about the good foods, the bad foods, the environment, the light, the circadian rhythm. But the kefir was something that moved the needle for you most. And so that's possibly why you look at it with a lot of endearment and you've made a business out of it. You've changed many people's lives you've got testimonials i mean it just there's a momentum that moves forward as you keep on changing lives which is incredible but tell us do you use raw milk with your kefir grains is that necessary i've used goat kefir i've used you know traditional dairy kefir i've used coconut kefir maybe i mean my smoothie that i make probably every day or every second day has got a lot of ferment, fermented products in it just because i I struggle sometimes with the sauerkraut taste or, you know, the those type of fermented foods. And I put it in my smoothie, which is beneficial. But maybe you can just sort of give us the differentiation between all these different types of kefir uh, and, and the uses and the benefits of each one. Sure. I mean, in terms of pasteurization, if you're using kefir grains, it doesn't really matter too much. So, some people are real purists where... You know, if they can source a good quality raw milk, that's that's the ultimate. You know, that's the because you've got the natural bacteria that are, that's in the the raw milk, raw goat's milk, even better. Goat's milk is probably the 
the most traditional type of kefir you can make. And then pasteurized, you know, as when you pasteurize the milk, you are changing the, the proteins and the structures of the proteins. But I mean, when you ferment it, fortunately, you know, the, the proteins get broken down into peptides. So it's not so detrimental. Whereas, you know, if you're drinking pasteurized milk, there's it's always there's always a, a a risk reward sort of benefit, because obviously with raw milk there's risk of contamination of food poisoning things like that. Tuberculosis was one of the reasons why they started pasteurizing milk, and then but then you move towards pasteurized and you've got, you know, a change in the protein structure it can be a bit more inflammatory. Fermenting it will mitigate most of those risks. So I'm not too concerned. UHT yeah. milk probably is the least one I'd recommend because it does, doesn't produce as good of a kefir as, say, the other two milks that we talked about. And then when you come to the other type of milks that you could use, you could definitely use coconut milk. You could use soy milk. You could use you know, oat milk. You know, they're all going to produce a kefir. It's not going to have the same peptides because obviously you're not starting with the same protein mix at the start. But look, there's still the, the organisms in there. When you're using plant-based milks, you have to add some form of uh, sugar substrate. So the easiest thing to do is just drop in a, a, a date or a, a fig, dried fig or dried date, preservative-free, and this will give it some food to actually to grow and to thrive. So out of all the, the, the alternative milks, soy milk produces the, the best type of kefir because the protein content is higher than the other two and it does produce quite a nice kefir. So, I mean, it's, you, you pick your own, your own journey. I mean, if you want to go plant-based, you know, this is a good alternative to still get the probiotic organisms if you're more purist and you're not too worried about, you know, the, the vegetarian, vegan sort of conversation, then the best, most research type of kefir with all the evidence, all the science behind it, all the peptides is going to be a milk-based product. I recommend just, you know, pasteurized dairy is fine. Choose like an A2 type cow, nice, nice soft protein, easy to digest. That will produce the best type of kefir. And if you can't find the A2 milk here, say in South Africa, do you? We've got a good uh, farm close by that produces raw milk. It's not pasteurized, obviously, and that's something that we try and have in the house. And raw cream as well. Raw cream to my right. coffee has been a game changer. But oh, yeah. if you can't, if you haven't found A2, what do you just use? You know, traditional raw or pasteurized, and that's fine. It's still going to produce the, the yeah. probiotics. Absolutely. It's going to be perfectly fine. You know, your goat's milk is going to be a great alternative as well. And if you're not sure whether something is A2 or not, not everybody, A2 has become a brand now. So mm. it's, a, it's a bit more challenging to navigate. But basically, A2 is a Jersey cow. So if you speak to the farmer, I think there might be another type. I can't remember what was the name. But the mm. most obvious one is your Jersey cows. So if something's branded as Jersey milk, well, you're not sure, ask the manufacturer, are these Jersey cows? That should bring some clarity into that decision-making process. And if you change the grains, like do different grains produce different organisms? Is that good to sort of change the grains up or, you know, you know, after a year use different grains or mix different grains? Is that a clever idea? That's a double-edged sword because... Ultimately, from a microbial diversity perspective, that's a great idea. You know, share share your grains with your friend, get them to share some, mix up the culture, and then you've got a bit more diversity in your actual uh, kefir. That's the first uh, thought bubble. The second thought bubble is that, and, and I think long-term kefir makers will, will appreciate this, it takes a long time to get the taste profile and the the, the organ, organoleptic qualities, you know, the taste, the smell, the, the thickness, the viscosity, all that. It takes a long time to find something that you love. So for me personally, I love my kefir the way it is and I don't want to mess with it <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, like 
if if I change it up a little bit, I mean, it might it might ferment too quickly, and all of a sudden, you know, it splits really fast, or it produces a really a smelly kefir, or it's too thin. You know what I mean? So I think the long term kefir makers will appreciate me saying this when you find something that works it's like hell yeah yes we've got it right i'm not going to change anything i'm going to do everything okay. the same water kefir makers will also appreciate this because you know they get to a point where their grains are multiplying and it's producing this beautiful uh, tasting uh, kefir or you know it's producing some gas so they're really happy with the fizziness or something about it. And then if they go mess with it, all of a sudden the grains dissolve and they disappear and then you got to start over again. <laughs> so yeah. I, I hear you. I hear you from that diversity perspective. Great idea. From a practical application, probably not a great idea, but each to their own, you know. But maybe you can just share some of your kefir with your friends in that so that they can send you some. You don't have to change the grains. You can oh, yeah. make some and then you give yeah. it to them and you take a oh, bit yes. and then you've got microbial diversity. Of course. And then you can just nourish your little pet, you know, and make sure yeah. that your pet produces what it needs to. Absolutely. Share share the kefir. That's a great idea. I mean, mm. you get some from their batch, you get some from yours and you mix it up, you know, and you're getting more diversity by just having different batches and, you know, slightly different environments, slightly different kefir grains. So you, they might have an organism that's a little bit different to yours that's got all these benefits or just the ratios are a little bit different as well. So, you know, with fermented foods, you know, diversity is always the key. Great idea, Steve. Okay. So my commitment is I'm going to order a kit from you. I'm going to start the process. I'm going to start videoing myself, put it on all my socials. We're growing nicely, especially on Instagram, which is cool. But uh, you can maybe, you know, I'll go to your website, walk me through the process. We can connect. Uh, possibly we can. I'm not. Are you delivering significantly to South Africa or you're not sure about those numbers through COVID? I mean, we, we don't get many orders from South Africa, but mm. obviously we, I don't think many people know about us in South Africa yet. Mm. So, but we can ship we can certainly ship to south africa i don't think it'll be a problem great brilliant uh, and you don't know sort of the duties or you have to pay them or the ease of getting it door to door and you know how will it be for the south african consumer or the african consumer because we're starting to grow into the rest of africa how will that work from a sort of you know uh, a procurement point of view i don't really know the duties uh, rules in south africa mm. always with any international orders, mm. consumers need to be cognizant that there could be some mm. duties involved. It's really tricky when it comes to duties because sometimes it mm. depends on the, the person on the day, what they decide. Yeah. You know, even when we ship to the US again, you know, some yeah. items will, will get duties applied or other items will get held up or other items will even get rejected. So mm. it's always up to the 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 duty officer or the uh, customs officer on the day and how they navigate. So that's a common problem that we have when, when we ship overseas. So you've got to be aware of that. Mm. Okay. So what I'm going to, I'm going to start then uh, I'll get in touch with your team or you can just link me with the right person, make the order, see how it comes through and, and we can go through that process. I wanted to ask you a little, just a personal story. We try to get Woolworths is a big brand in South Africa, sort of a premier supermarket brand, high end, and uh, they do organic coffee, which I've checked out. I try to, they've got an organic milk and their processes and their protocols are pretty strict, but they won't make a cappuccino with organic coffee and organic milk and organic milk is on their shelves and we, and we try to do a whole social push but not, nothing from them from dairy's point of view because i mean as a nutrition scientist how important is it to use the organic dairy versus the conventional traditional dairy i think it's incredibly important because by using organic i mean there's standards on antibiotic usage their standards on any additives hormones so all these these additives they they're used in conventional dairy but if you look at the price difference of conventional dairy versus organic it's often it's you know chalk and cheese and organic is much more expensive because it's more difficult to make it and you don't get the same level of yield so i i think you know if you can afford organic definitely choose organic 
versus conventional, but I'm not sure why Woolworths are doing that. Maybe it's the cost. Maybe mm. it's a purely a cost a conversation. Maybe they're not going to be able to make enough margin on using organic. Or maybe the con- look. They, I've they, asked the question. Yeah, yeah, and they, have, and they haven't come back to me with anything. You know, it's sitting on their shelves there. I don't mind paying extra. You know, they give you the option of oat. They give you the option of soy. They give you the option of almond. You know, some stores give you the option of macadamia, but it, you know, they don't give you the option of organic dairy. It, it's just a fascinating process. I don't think you can find organic coffee and organic. Uh, dairy product uh, in in this country and the milk lab products that come from Australia that everybody's raving the stuff inside there is horrific it's horrendous all the you know the the seed oils these processed seed oils Mm. that they're using in these milks I mean I tell my clients and my patients try not to use those because you're increasing that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio which is not Mm. beneficial at all I don't know what your take is on that completely agree I mean seed oils the omega-6s are you know, really toxic and poisonous products. You know, again, with my, my nutrition clients as well, you know, always steering them towards your natural types of fats, not the, the processed fats. So they're, they're the most toxic products on the planet. Things like canola, you know, sunflower, all these oils, they're just really highly inflammatory in the body. Soybean oil is probably the worst of the lot. Mm, That is the cheapest and nastiest oil that's used in a lot of processed food products, fast food products. So, you know, you're much better off going for your natural fats, natural oils. The one I use the most when it comes to cooking is avocado. I, I love avocado oil. Or if I have to do some very low temperature frying, I'll use olive oil as well. Mm. salads will be mainly olive oil and a plethora of butter you know your your full your full fat dairies you know they're all they're all great again again but again it's it's an individual conversation you know that this is what works for me you know if i'm working with a client that's got a slightly you know, impaired gut where they're having problems digesting fats or their microbiome is not conducive to saturated fat, then it's a slightly different conversation. But holistically speaking, I can say hand on heart, you know, the those uh, processed vegetable fats are poison, absolute poison. Mm. There's, there's, there's no place for those products in anyone's diet. <laughs> Whereas mm, your, absolutely. your, you know, your avocado oils, your, your butters, your, your cheeses, you know, they're, they're good for most, most people, you know, aside mm. from a few that have uh, dys- dysbiosis problems or they choose not to have it based on, um, you know, cultural or veganism, mm. or sustainability, things like that. Great. Let's talk about the microbiome. Any latest research, number one, and then I want you to take the audience and the viewers through Crib and Governor's uh, sort of care of his microbiome, how he looks after his microbiome, obviously including and focusing on kefir and what you're doing, how much time it takes to you know, look after this pet and feed this pet and check this pet and make sure this pet is producing what you want it to do. So tell us, what do you do? How does it, your morning start, your whole day, when you use sort of fermented foods for the audience? Yeah, sure. Let's unpack it. So in terms of the, the microbiome, the hottest areas in the microbiome tend to be your prebiotics. That that seems to be the hottest area of research right now. So, you know, early days, there was a lot of research happening on the the probiotic organisms and the different strains. But I think what we're starting to understand now is that much more powerful tools lie in that prebiotic, postbiotic space. So, you know, when I deal with a client and I look at their, their stool profile and I can see deficiencies or excesses in the microbiome, typically the first thing I'm going to do is use some form of prebiotic because your prebiotic will firstly, it'll bolster up, you know, organisms that are lacking, that I feel that are lacking, you know, you know, you, like your short chain fatty acid producing uh, organisms, which are a very common one to, to bolster up. But then also, you know, because the prebiotics then lead to the postbiotics. So this, these are the compounds that the bacteria produces. So, you know, I mentioned short-chain fatty acids, which is a perfect example of a postbiotic. 
but this is the fuel source for the gut colonocytes. So they use this as fuel. So a lot of people, when they have issues with not getting enough fiber or you know, diversity of plant foods in the diet, they're very deficient in these short chain fatty acids. And this is leading to things like leaky gut and gut impairment. So, you know, and now, we, I mean, we're discovering so many different prebiotics, you know, there's uh, XOS, ZOS, GOS, uh, there's a whole plethora. Partially hydrolyzed guar gum is my go-to one because it doesn't create much gas, you know, it doesn't cause bloating. Fossil inulin is another one, but scientists are discovering more and more. And there's a huge amount of research going into polyphenols because polyphenols themselves about 80% of polyphenols can't be digested by you. They have to go to the gut and be digested in the large intestine or the colon by the microbiome. So a lot of the benefits are actually coming off the polyphenols. You know, there was a buzz thing with polyphenols years and years ago, get your antioxidants and your polyphenols. But it turns out that most of the benefits are coming from the the postbiotics created by the breakdown of the polyphenols by the bacteria. So a perfect, perfect example is a pomegranate or, or things like strawberries or raspberries, very rich in polyphenols. But what, what actually creates a lot of the benefits is that these polyphenols that are present in these fruits are broken down into allergic acid, which is where the benefits are coming from. So, you know, the microbiome is becoming extremely nuanced because one person might have the right type of bacteria to do that conversion, to convert the, that polyphenol into a lagic acid. So if I see that on a stool sample, I'm like, yes, G Gordini bacteria is the specific type mm. of bacteria. I'm like, yes, this person's got a free kick straight away. This is easy. Get them to eat more strawberries, uh, pomegranate, because they've got the, the right bug in there to do the conversion to get that mm -hmm. allergic acid. Can, and then even further into urolithin A, which is you know a whole lot of mi mitochondria benefits as well. So we look at those nuances. We can even look at nuances of something like uh, types of bacteria that can break down the uh, soy isoflavones. Flav 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 so if you've got the right type of bacteria, then all of a sudden you're going to do pretty well with soy, you know, because you've got the right players on that team to be able to use soy in a beneficial mm. way. Whereas if someone doesn't have that player, they're not going to get the same benefits from soy. So sure. there's all these type of nuances when you look at a, at a stool profile. So that's where the research is at. So what was the, the next one after that? Tell us about your sort of uh, plan, your fermentation daily plan, your yeah. kefir, how much time you're spending to, you know, nourish this pet. Yep. I, it's, it's become almost a, a robotic exercise. It's, it's something I don't even think about. The, the way I start my day is the first thing I do is I go and brush my teeth in my backyard out in the sun with very minimal clothes. <laughs> so fortunately, <laughs> my, my, my backyard is, is very sealed off in Bali. If, if people know Bali, most people have an outdoor shower and it's yeah. very private. So I just go out, brush my teeth in, you know, as just minimal clothing, sunlight straight in my eyes. Then the next thing I do is I do a 20 minute meditation just to get the day started, you know, calm, present, focused. When, when, when I meditate, I, this is when my mind is racing, all the really important things flow to the surface. I give it some time and then I go back to just being really, you know, empty as possible. And that goes by pretty fast. I've got a, I've got a sauna in my, uh, my villa as well. So I'll do a 15 minute sauna session with my wife. I'll have a cold shower. I'll do some rebounding. And then breakfast is when the fermented foods start. You know, obviously the kefir with some, just a little bit of fruit, a bit of uh, you know, natural honey. We get great honey here in Bali, raw honey, bee pollen, all my supplements, different supplements that I take. And then I start my day. 
But then in terms of the, the fermented foods, I try to incorporate a fermented food in each meal. So, you know, at lunchtime, it'll be maybe a bit of miso or it'll be some sauerkraut, some kimchi. So every meal has some element of something fermented, some yogurt even, just some homemade yogurt. So it's pretty simple. I, I don't make it too complicated, but this is my, my daily routine. Mm. But how are you nurturing those grains and who's putting the cream? Are you using raw milk or who's putting the cream and who's watching them? The splitting, it grows so fast, it starts bubbling. Oh, I mean, I can just remember my story 10 years ago. My wife was like, the stuff's in the fridge. What are you doing? We can't go. We can't smell anything else. So tell us a little bit about that process. I, I'm really lucky. I mean, in, in Australia, I'd, I'd be looking after it myself, but you know, people that live in Bali, you know, we have we have lots of help. So we have um, people in our villa, you know, people that look after the, mm. the grains for us. Uh, I, I don't really have to think about it. I've, I've trained them initially. So yeah, all okay. I know is I, I wake up in the morning and I've got some <laughs> kefir in my fridge. <laughs> so the whole straining and the, the process side of it's been yeah. out, outsourced. Yeah. So it's pretty okay. easy. Okay, but tell us about when you go to Melbourne, what you do then? Because, I mean, obviously yeah. this is something that a lot of people will need to do themselves. Obviously in South yeah. Africa, we've got a lot of help, so we can outsource it, or some people can. But tell us the process of looking after this pet. The most important thing is consistency and keeping it at room temperature and keeping it fed. So as soon as you, you take a bit of a break, you put it in the fridge, as I mentioned before, then it becomes really sluggish and the, the mixture of bacteria shifts. So then you're going to struggle to get it back to its original potency. It's going to take quite a few batches. So the key thing is, you know, get into a routine Set up your morning, however you want to set it up, what needs to be done, but at some point allocate some time to actually doing the straining, which is pretty fast. I mean, it's literally, you know, if you use a kefir co, it's faster because it's got the strainer built into the lid. But, you know, it's just as easy as you get a kitchen strainer, you pour out your kefir into the strainer, let the kefir drain out, use your clean fingers, push the kefir through, take the grains, put it into a clean jar, top up with milk, cover it, restart, and then repeat that process every 24 okay. to 48 hours. 24 to 48 hours. So you could produce yeah. significant amounts of kefirium. You could distribute this down to your neighbors across. So, but just take us from the start. I mean, you get the grains. I'm going to order from you. You fill it up with what milk that you want. You cover it. You put it out. You leave it outside initially. You put it yes. in. The, what do you do exactly? It never goes in the fridge unless you strain, you've strained it and you've put it in there for storage. But the grains okay. always stay outside. So okay. this is how you keep them optimized because the temperature is just right for them outside. They don't get sluggish. So then it depends on your own climate. So I'm assuming South Africa, it's pretty warm. You're going to produce kefir probably every 24 hours. So, you know, it's just a, a, table, a teaspoon of grains, 250 mils of milk. So you're going to produce roughly 250 mils of kefir. Strain it out. The kefir grains will be left in the strainer. So then you take the grains back in, 250 mils of milk, start again. It's really easy. It's a simple process. It's a little bit tedious because you do it every day, but... For so some people, it becomes like a meditation. It's something they start to enjoy and they love. So okay. it's not, not yeah. rocket science. Last one that I wanted to go into came to the end of the show because I know you're involved in deuterium depleted products and testing. I had Victor Sagalowski on the podcast from Light Water. Obviously, there's a big move for patients that are really sick to do DDW water. Tell us where you are on that process. Maybe we can do another podcast end of the year or next year. What is happening with DD water and how important is it? DD is, is huge, especially we, we, part, we partnered with a preventer. So Preventer is pretty much the leading manufacturer of, of DDW in the world out of Hungary. And they recently sent me a paper as well with COVID. So using deuterium depleted mm -hmm. water, they, their PPM is around 20. So, you know, for real sick, really sick people, we use the lower PPMs because 
you know, this is going to exert that that benefit when people are really sick with things like cancer or uh, metabolic diseases, COVID. You can even use a DDW. Probably 80 is a good place to, to use. If you're really sick, then you use the 20. But general health, I think anywhere between, say, 120 and 140 is a good place just for general health. But if you're really sick, you're working with really sick clients, then it's going to be eight, around 80 would be where I'd start with. And if they're really sick, go right down to your 20, 25 ppm. Okay. Is that Laszlo Boris that you speak? Is that he, is he prevent? Mm, not Laszlo Boris. That would be uh, Dr. Gabor Shamliai. Okay. But oh, they're, they're okay. affiliated with each other. They're friends. So they okay. they do a lot of research together with uh, Laszlo okay. Boris, Dr. Laszlo Boris and uh, Dr. Gabor Shamliai. Okay. So maybe we can get you those links. Uh, I don't think you can find DDW in South Africa that we've looked at. We're not sure with the demand in COVID. Obviously, it's an expensive product. But just quickly, the testing, how important has that been? Have, has that been a sort of big uptake in, in testing people's levels of uh, deuterium? We, admittedly, with the deuterium testing, we, we decided to shut that down. Okay. Because, because we moved here to Australia, and that requires quite a lot of technical expertise so, okay. and plus the labs that we were using during the, the shutdown, they, they also it became too difficult for us to send uh, saliva samples. Okay. So it became a nightmare to, to deal with because okay. obviously with COVID and all that happening mm, at the same sure. time, we decided just to pull the plug on it. Just wasn't okay. worth it. But, you know, in future, there's lots of demand for it. I mean, we get lots yeah. of emails of people asking for the test. It's just not the okay. right time for it now. We'll just wait for sure. things to settle down. And then in future, we can look at implementing it again. Brilliant. Well, those that are listening, go and check out Kribben Dava on the YouTube. He looks incredible. His skin is glowing. I don't know if he should move from Bali back to Melbourne. <laughs> looks like <laughs> Bali has treated you exceptionally well. You've got a great lifestyle. When do you head? Are you going to head back? And is there a possibility of staying in Bali? I've got lots of uh, projects here in Bali at the moment to keep me really busy. So we're keeping a very open mind. Obviously, we've got a lot of setup still to happen for our Asian market here. So I, I'd say at least the next few months, I'll be still based in Bali. And then we'll see how things play out with uh, Australia pretty soon. Mm, good. Where can people connect with you, Kriven? Uh, tell us about your social media, how they can get onto your website and, and all your channels. Yeah, sure. The easiest way to connect with me is on via Instagram, just at Gut Health Gurus. The website is very simple, just nourish me organic, www.nourishmeorganics.com.au. And really, you know, if you want to go deep in what we're talking about, the podcast, the Gut Health Gurus podcast, which was, I think, having some good success in South Africa recently, number one in Namibia. So that's in Africa. So we got to number one. Yeah number one in Oman, I think. So kind of close to yeah. Africa. So we're starting to make some waves around the African area, mm. but still our, our main market is still you know, Australia, Canada, UK, mm. US, yeah. where we're, we're really popular. But guys, yeah, check out the podcast. You know, it's it's scientific in, in nature, but we try and simplify it and bring you the latest and most cutting edge uh, scientific information that we can. Well, Thank you so much, Kevin Govinda. Declare favor and blessing over you that your dreams may actually come into fruition. You're a man of much character, truth. You want to see people's lives transformed. And it's been a privilege to partner with you, to get to know you, to share your incredible wisdom. Because you're a man not only of the science, but you're a man of experience. You've experienced what it is to have mental ill health, the anxiety, the depression, what happened to you. You've got some incredible uh, pictures on Instagram that I saw how, how you were, what you looked like compared to what you look like now. So people can go and check that out so thank you so much my pleasure steve thank you so much for having me brilliant thanks Kribben. really appreciate your time maybe we can uh, sort of just connect and, and and put you guys an affiliate on my website mate let, sure. let me start importing some things maybe you've got your head operations manager that i can deal with directly it might just be easier i can order a whole bunch of products see what the duties are see you know the hassle factor which you know is a bit tricky sometimes with south african you know port health that we've had a lot of products just being held up for port health and unfortunately they're looking for bribes they're looking for money you know there's just so much corruption unfortunately in the system but 
I do want to give it a go. And then if it does work and it's easy, then we can just put you in a, as an affiliate and, and see what happens. Sure. Happy to, happy to explore. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I think via email, if you can just drop me the person that I should connect with and then we can, we can go from there. Yeah, sure. We'll do that. Brilliant, Kriven. Have a super evening. I know it's probably afternoon there. And uh, thanks for your time and well done on your expansion. You, you're an inspiration to me. Made to Thrive is only two years old or not even two years old. So uh, yeah, just uh, keep going. Yeah, I'll, I'll just stop this recording and you can chat more. <laughs>